Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I am going to stop my video, but you, when I do that, you should still be able to see the screen. So we're continuing on with our discussion from Saturday, and we did, you went over some basic elements of classification, if you remember, starting with the binomial nomenclature system. Then we talked a little bit about some horticultural type of classifications where we talk about things as grasses and broadleafs and sedges and annuals and perennials and biennials. So, uh, and then we talked a little bit about dormancy uh, and heat and uh, cold zones. So that was some of the stuff we covered. And then we started into some of the basic uh, structures of the plant and talked about uh, monocots versus dicots. And then we got into the structures, which we began with roots and we covered stems. So today we're going to do leaves. Uh, that will complete our vegetative plant parts, and then we will go into the reproductive plant parts, which are flower, fruits, and seeds. Uh, that should go pretty fast on this first part, and then uh, we will go over functions of plants after that. So uh, quickly, let's look at leaves then, and the function of leaves for plants, the number one thing that plants' leaves are their factories. Uh, photosynthesis is, you remember, you should remember, photo means light, synthesis means creation. And so photosynthesis literally means making something in the presence of light. So and what we're making are carbohydrates or sugars. And that's why the leaves are often called the factories of the plant. Uh, leaves can also be used by a plant uh, as a wildlife deterrent because you'll have a lot of prickly leaves and that will keep some things from wanting to eat them, particularly in dry climates like what we're in. And uh, propagation, some leaves, particularly more succulent leaves, uh, plants can grow other plantlets on them, or if that leaf hits the ground, uh, sometimes you'll see plantlets start on the edges of leaves, but there's gonna be much more likely to happen with a succulent leaf than, uh, what I would consider a traditional uh, shrub type leaf. And if it's, particularly if that leaf is, is detached from the parent plant. So that is another function of leaves by plants. It's also the site of transpiration. Uh, you'll have water storage in that leaf also. So especially those succulent leaves, it's a place that water can be stored. Um, and another thing we don't think about is shading. Shading is uh, those leaves are going to keep the rest of the plant or even the leaves underneath it cooler because they are producing shade. And I think it's a, this is a great time to go out and look, but go into neighborhoods and look at tall trees. And I see it a lot with like um, um, cottonwood trees. That's the one that my neighbor had for the longest that I would notice it in the top edges of the leaves look really bad at the very top of the canopy. But as you go further into that canopy, you're gonna see uh, much greener and much better looking leaves because those upper leaves are providing shade for the interior canopy. So um, that is a, a function, how plants use those leaves to help the rest of the plant stay cooler uh, with shade that we don't often think about. And uh, again, we have, uh, Inside that leaf is where transpiration occurs, which is a natural cooling process. We'll cover that a little bit later under plant functions. So the parts of this leaf, some terms you may hear. Uh, if you hear about the plant leaf tip, that's gonna be this little point up here. Sometimes it's a point, sometimes it's not. It can be rounded. Um, when you hear I'm talking about the midrib, that's that central vein that goes up. And then you can have uh, lateral veins off of that. Uh, and this one, you'll see the, how this splits off and splits off. And that's a netted vein. So do you all remember what kind of plant this would be then that we're looking at? It would be a dicot. Just uh, that should be a little reminder of what we did. When we talk about the margin, this is the outside edge of the entire 
leaf. This is the leaf margin, which you see in purple here. Uh, the petiole is the, the stem-like structure that attaches the big flat part of the leaf to the main stem. That is the petiole. Now, when this leaf is bursting out and uh, when it first emerges, you may have some little structures uh, that were protecting that immature leaf before it emerged. And those are called stipules. And then where a leaf is attached to that stem, you remember right here where that leaf is attached, on the stem, it's called a node. That is where the petiole is attached to the stem. So those are the, some of the plant parts you may see. The petiole, again, this yellow portion right here. Uh, the leaf, oh, the leaf blade or the lamina, that is the main portion, the part in between the veins is called the lamina or the main part or the blade of that, that leaf. So uh, a term you may see, again, the midrib is that central vein, and then the margin is the edge. Now, if we cut it, take a cross section through this leaf, you're going to see some different layers. And these are the typical layers of a leaf and going from the top of the leaf to the bottom, what you'll first see at the very top is a waxy layer called the cuticle. And its whole purpose is to protect that leaf from drying out, uh, from wind, from sun, things like that. And, and that cuticle, depending on how thick it is and how waxy it is, can also protect it from insects and other things. Underneath that is a one layer of cells. And although it looks like it's green here, this is a clear layer of cells. They do not have chlorophyll in them. They are just standard cells. And that is the epidermis or the skin. This is the upper epidermis or the upper, quote, skin of the leaf. Then uh, underneath that, you're going to see layers of cells that run like columns. And that is the palisade parenchyma and uh they run up and down and they have little, you see these little green spots? That is chloroplasts inside. Chloroplasts are organelles inside those cells that contain chlorophyll, and that's what's needed for photosynthesis. So you have these all in uh, like columns through here. So you have a lot of chlorophyll and usually the top of a leaf tends to be darker than the bottom. Uh, this is the upper part of the mesophyll. Meso meaning mid middle. So this is the middle part of the leaf. Underneath it, there is another layer of parenchyma, sometimes called the spongy parenchyma, which has a lot of air spaces between it. And it makes a real loose grid. Uh, when I see this, I think about a sponge, you know, how you have a grid through a sponge and it allows air to move in and out and around through the leaf. And that's gonna be really important because that air exchange is what's needed for photosynthesis. So here we have the spongy parenchyma, uh, and that is the, 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 the bottom portion of the mesophyll. So when you have the upper palisade parenchyma and the bottom spongy parenchyma together, that whole section in the middle of the leaf is what we call the mesophyll or the mesophyll. Uh, at the bottom, we have another layer of skin called the epidermis. Again, the lower epidermis, and then there's more um, another layer of cuticle, as you'll see underneath. In that lower la layer of epidermis, you'll also periodically see some small cells uh, that have a hole between them, and they will have chlorophyll in them. These are guard cells. And what guard cells do is they regulate air and water movement in and out of the leaf. So the space between them is the stoma and the or sometimes called the uh, stomatal pore is the actual opening. But I'll tell you one word you don't use around biologists or botanists, never use the word stomate, even though it's a lot of people will talk about that re referring to this uh, guard cell with the stomatal pore in it. That is, they're gonna say that's a stoma, not a stomate. So they're very particular about that. Um, so it just depends if you want to bother your, your botany friends, call it a stomate and say you don't care. Um, but what it does do is it allows air to move from outside the leaf into here and move up around 
either into the palisade parenchyma or into the spongy parenchyma to uh, allow photosynthesis and water exchange. One other part that's in the leaf, you'll see here, this is part of a vein, and this is probably a side vein. And with it, you're going to see some uh, bundle sheath extensions uh, because it, it's basically this vein's coming through. You're going to have xylem in there. You're going to have phloem in there. And then this is a bundle sheath layer around the outside edge. Since it's a bundle sheath, that's telling us that it's going to be a monocot. Could be a uh, corn leaf or something like that. But you basically, this is similar to how the veins are set up also in a um, dicot as well. You're going to have uh, an extension that's holding that vein in place in the middle. Uh, and these are just... Uh, small cells that really their function is is space holders. They're kind of like bricks that are holding up a tube in the middle of the leaf. So you have them at the top and at the bottom. So um, the bundle sheath is actually just protecting the xylem and the phloem. And if you, this whole component in the middle is the vein, the plant vein. And as you remember from last time, uh, that vein is going to have the vascular tissue and it has xylem and it has phloem. The xylem is smaller components in here and that's going to be carrying water and nutrients into the leaf from the root system. And then you have phloem, which is gonna take the carbohydrates that are being made through photosynthesis and uh, carry them to other parts of the plant. So uh, this is what a vein of a leaf would look like here. So. Those are, that's a cross section of a leaf. Uh, some other things about leaves are uh, how they're arranged and the parts of that leaf. Uh, and one thing we talk about with leaves lots of times in the arrangement uh, is the leaf venation. You know, we talked earlier about having parallel veins in a monocot, like in a corn leaf, where the veins are running up and down the whole length of the leaf. You can see that here in this uh, uh, drawing of uh, parallel venation. We also, within the dicots, we talk about both pinnate and palmate venation. And pinnate looks like uh, the pin feather of a bird. And you can see it's long and narrow. It has a midrib and then it has lateral uh, veins that come from there. So it looks just like a feather. Where a palmate will look like the palm of your hand. And the best example of a palmate one that you can relate to is gonna be like a uh, the Canada maple leaf, or here we have sycamores that have that, that palmate venation that's spread out with uh, several large veins coming out uh, arranged like the palm of your hand. So uh, again, pinnate versus palmate versus parallel venation. When we start describing plants, if you're ever asked to key out a plant, that's what they're gonna be looking at is the plant venation. And they start with, is it uh, parallel or is it palmate or pinnate? So that's a very, this is for a simple leaf. This is all one total leaf. This is one total leaf. And this is the end of a leaf. Remember that leaf is going to extend where the sheath attaches to the stem on a monocot. So then some uh, other leaf shapes and types you need to know about is, first of all, is a simple versus a compound leaf. A simple leaf is just one portion. It has one part to it. A compound leaf has multiple parts or leaflets to it. So let's show you, and you can have a simple pinnate and a simple palmate leaf. You only have simple leaves in the monocots. So uh, in a, a dicot though, you can have either a simple pinnate or a simple palmate leaf. And then you can have a compound pinnate or a compound palmate leaf. And if that's not strange enough, you can, each of those, uh, sections can sometimes split off and you can have a doubly pinnate or doubly palmate compound leaf. So uh, other things that we look at in leaves again are the leaf tips. Remember, is it going to be a pointed leaf tip? Is it going to be a rounded leaf tip? The leaf margins on the edges, sometimes we'll talk of whether it is a smooth leaf margin or is it a serrated leaf margin, which would be jagged like a, a serrated knife. Uh, but they're always used in descriptions and classifications when we start uh, trying to figure out what kind of a plant is. Uh, so you may hear some of these terms, pinnate and palmate and 
and compound, double compound leaves. I just want you to be familiar with that. So let's look at a few examples of these leaf shapes and types. This is a simple pinnate leaf. And if you look, the edge is slightly serrated on it. It is got a pointed leaf tip here, but this is a simple pinnate leaf. And again, it is a dicot. This is the petiole, and this is where it will attach to the stem down here. So this entire thing is one leaf. This is a simple palmate leaf. This is a sycamore leaf. It is a Texas native, and you see it has one, two, three, four, five major veins and a couple of smaller ones. And from there, they split off again. But it does look like the palm of your hand. So that is a simple palmate leaf. Now, a compound pinnate leaf, this is a um, pecan leaf. And if you look at this pecan leaf, this is one entire palm pecan leaf. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or four, six, 10 different leaflets on it. This is a leaflet. And the reason I know this is if you look at the base here where this is attached, there is not a bud. And since there is not a branch or a bud there, you can tell this is just a leaflet and not a true leaf. This central midrib, the rachis that's here um, on a compound leaf, it's sometimes called the rachis, where it attaches to the stem down here of the trunk or that branch, you will find a bud. Because remember where a leaf is attached to a stem, you will have a bud. It may be dormant and it may be very small, but that is one of the identifying characteristics of it to help you figure out where the leaf actually begins. So that is a compound pinnate leaf. This is a compound uh, palmate leaf, and this is a Hawaiian shufflera. And if you look at this, we sometimes think this is a leaf, but this is a leaflet. Because if you look down in here, there is not a branch uh, bud it, at the base of this. So this is a leaflet. They're all attached to one place. And then here's your, your main midrib coming down and it will attach to the stem back over here and you will find a branch down there. So this is a, a compound palmate leaf. And then if you look at something like this, which um, I'm not exactly sure, but it, this is a bipinnate compound leaf, which means it's double, it's got, this is, uh, these are all the individual leaflets, but here's the first branch off. This is your central midrib here, and then it goes in uh, branches once, and then the leaflets go off of that. So, so this is a bipinnate compound or a doubly compound pinnate leaf. Same thing, it just depends on who's writing the book. Uh, and so when you look at something like this, a mesquite tree has a uh, double compound, sometimes even a triple compound leaf when you look at it. So a this is not a mesquite leaf. Even this is not a mesquite leaf. When you look at it, it attaches to the stem way down here. Uh, and even the, these can split as well. So you can even have a triply compound pinnate leaf on a mesquite tree. So go look at your mesquite trees in your neighborhood next time you're out. That's, your, that's one of your homeworks to look at the uh, bipinnate or triple pinnate compound leaf. Another element with leaves is how they're arranged on the stem, how they're attached uh, and how many they are and, and where they fall on the stem individually as individual leaves. So the three basic types you're going to hear about is a rosulet, which it means a rosette, meaning it's really tight and it has a really short stem to it. <laughs> uh, you sometimes uh, will talk about alternate leaf arrangement. We'll talk about opposite leaf arrangement and world leaf arrangement. So uh, the examples of these, uh, let's start with the opposite, alternate, and uh, world. Opposite means you have two leaves attached at the same spot on the stem, and they are across from each other, opposite of each other. So you can see it here. Or over here, you can see uh, in the black and white version. You see how these two leaves are across from themselves on the on the branch. This would be opposite arrangement. Where alternate, it's kind of like a, a step ladder, and you go back and forth. 
left, right, left, right, uh, working up. A willow has alternate with in the color picture, you'll see how the willow, ha willow has alternate leaf arrangement. And then world means you have three or more leaflets attached at the same spot on the stem. And uh, so this is a catalpa, it has three here. You can see over here, this world leaf arrangement where there's like six um, leaflets attached over here. So that gives you an idea if you have all the leaves around in a circle and the stem goes up and you have another circle of leaves, that's a world leaf arrangement. And this is important when we start identifying the types of plants because uh, when you go into keys, they'll say it has alternate leaf arrangement or opposite leaf arrangement or world. And then sometimes they'll talk about rose, uh, uh which is kind of like uh, many of our succulents is what I think about. Uh, they kind of have that circular motion and, and they're not directly opposite of each other when they're short and they're tight uh, together. So uh, that's what we're talking about. So that's that's the end of leaves and leaf arrangement. So we've talked about leaf structures, leaf functions, leaf arrangements. Uh, I think the one thing I didn't mention on here now that I go back and I'm, I'm looking at it is how men use leaves because uh, I've been doing that on all the other, but you know, we eat leaves. A lot of this, the plant parts we eat like lettuce, we're eating the leaves. And also even in the, uh, remember when we're eating the fleshy part of an onion, that's the fleshy leaves that are around that little center stem. So if you only eat the outside of the, the onion, I guess when you're doing the blooming onion at, at uh, uh, Outback, you're eating the onion leaves uh, unless you eat the very center. So that's man's, uh, some of man's uses of leaves. Uh, and large leaves like palm leaves, palm fronds can also be used for um, shade or uh, creating shelters and stuff like that for very, very large leaves. And palms are probably one of the things that you would see that most used for. Uh, so that's the end of leaves. And I'm ready to go into reproductive structures of plants uh, next. And so I said, those are going to be flower fruits and seeds. And when I, I told you I'm giving you my freshman botany class in four hours. And so I, the beginning of my freshman botany class, Dr. George Willigas down in Kingsville, Texas, when it was still Texas A&I, uh, I walked into freshman biology class in January of uh, 1985. And the first statement he made in class uh, to start his lecture was, plants are sexy. And that's a that's a statement we just don't really think about. But plants are sexy to other plants. And I guess once you understand the sexual or reproductive side of plants, you'll see that there's a lot of, of elements of plants uh, that reproductive side or the sexual part of plants that's visible. And so uh, don't be embarrassed by it. But I wanted you to have us think about plants a little bit differently. So here you'll see a sago palm, and this is one of the things we talked about. Sago palms have male and female uh, plants. And so within there, this is the cone, which this is the male portion of the sago palm in a, a male sago palm. And the female will actually have a more flattened center section in here, and it will have uh, seeds, naked seeds that are inside there that will produce uh, once they're, they're pollinated by the pollen from here. In a hibiscus plant here, you're seeing the uh, red uh, stigma coming out here. You're, you're, you're seeing the pistil coming out and also the, the male uh, pollen sacs that are wrapped around it. That's a specialized type of, of pollen structure. So uh, you'll see this where the male and female parts are in a single flower or you could, and you can have male and female flowers on the same plant, like in a squash plant, has a male, the same plant can have a male flower and a female flower. Uh, they're not together. Most plants, a lot of plants have male and female uh, plant parts together in a single plant, uh, in a single flower structure. So just, we'll go over part of this as we, we move on. But again, thinking about plants a little bit differently, now, you know, you're going to be one of the group of 
people that will see plants. When you go see flowers, you go, ooh, that plant's kind of sexy there. Maybe. So let's talk about flowers. It's the main portion when we talk about reproductive plants, uh, plant parts, is the flower. Um, and those, I want you to remember that flowers are really a form of modified leaf. A flower is where leaves have been modified into reproductive structures. So, but they have uh, some of the same characteristics of parts of those flowers do. Um, so flowers are often modified leaves. Uh, they are arranged in whorls. Remember, we talked about whorls. That circle, uh, a bunch of, of leaves are attached in the same spot on the stem. Well, in flower parts, you're going to have a whorl of, of sepals, which is the outside portion, uh, the green part that covers the flower bud. You're going to have an outside, inside there, you're going to have whorls of petals. Uh, then you're going to have whorls of stamen, which are the male portions, and you'll have whorls of, uh, that form the pistil or the female portions, and those are often fused together. So they are arranged in whorls, just like we saw on that arrangement of leaves on a stem. So kind of like the flower, but it's kind of like a modified stem with modified leaves on it. It's kind of an easy way to think about it. Some things about flowers that you do need to know. Remember, flower parts those petals, and even the stamen and the, the fused sections of that pistil are in multiples of three in monocots and fours and fives in dicots. Because if you look at a hibiscus flower and you look at that stamen coming up, coming out, you're going to have five little groupings of, of pollen sacs around it. But in the middle of the pistil, in the middle, that dark portion, that's the female part. If you look carefully, it's going to have five little bumps, and that's five portions that have fused together to make the pistil. Uh, and up at the tip of it is going to be the stigma. We'll talk about the other parts of the female part of the, the flower in just a second. But again, they're arranged in whorls. And, and again, those are still going to have the multiples of threes or fours and fives, depending on whether it's a monocot or a dicot. Flowers, what is the number one function of flower? You know, a flower is going to be there for reproduction. And the thing it has to do, it has to have the right pollination. So it will attract pollinators. And that's what the pretty petals of a flower are for, is to attract insects, to attract animals, to attract uh, birds like hummingbirds, uh, butterflies, bees, whatever. So that's what that uh, the petals, that a colorful portion is really there for. But the goal of the overall flower is reproduction and uh, creating seeds. And so it would be sexual reproduction. And a part of that that's really important is having genetic diversity. And that will help with the survival of that plant. One thing you need to realize is that a fruit is a ripened ovary. So this, the ovary part of the flower, when it ripens after it's been pollinated and uh, the, the sperm within that pollen grain makes its way down into the ovary, that ovary will, will continue to develop and form. And as it ripens, it forms the fruit and the seeds inside of it. So the ovary portion of the flower will eventually become the fruit. So flower parts, if you want to look at a picture of, of a basic flower here, you have the pedicel, which is kind of the, the stem-like portion that attaches the bud to the main stem. You have a receptacle, uh, which is a base of the flower. Sometimes this receptacle will also develop uh, into part of the fruit in some variations. Uh, we're not going to get real particular, but the, the el enlarged section at the bottom of the flower is the receptacle. Then you have the little leaflet structures, leaf-like structures that cover the flower bud when it is uh, developing. Those are called the sepals. And then we have the petals. And the, uh, we're, we're familiar with petals. 
Now, one thing you need to know, uh, the sepals, when you look at, you have a single sepal or you have all of the sepals on that flower. If you look at all the sepals on that individual flower, it's called the calyx. You have an individual petal, or if you look at all the petals on that flower, it's collectively called the corolla. So again, that's really a botany thing, not a horticulture thing. We still look at them as sepals and petals, uh, but a good biologist, a good botanist is going to look at uh, the petals and the sepals together collectively. When you look at those two together, it's called the perianth. And again, that is really a botany thing, not a horticulture thing. So as gardeners, because gardeners are really just practical side of horticulture, we don't even use that word very often. But every now and then it gets thrown out, if, if especially if you're doing research and you get into biology books. So uh, again, and this is, is just, uh, and I want to call it the asexual part of the flower, because within this flower, then you're going to have a male portion, which is collectively called the stamen. Should be easy to remember. You know, you women are probably going stamen, stay away. So uh, anyway, the, the, the men gives it away, being the male portion. It consists of the filament, which is this long structure that lifts the anther, uh, which is where the pollen is. The pollen grains are on the anther develop on the anther and it pulls them up out of the center of the flower up so they can either be captured by the wind or by some other pollinator and usually gets them closer to the stigma which is the the sticky portion of the female section of the flower so again the anther the which is where the pollen sacs are up at the top of of the male portion of the flower the filament is the, the part that holds it up. And collectively, it's called the stamen. And again, they are arranged in whorls in the flower. To the interior, the very interior of the flower is going to be the female portion. Collectively, is called the pistil. And it has three main sections. You're going to have the stigma at the top, which is a sticky portion. You're going to have the style, the elongated portion that lifts up the stigma. And then you have the ovary down at the bottom where the egg is. The ovaries and uh, the ovules and the eggs are inside. Um, so when you look at this together, the ovary, the big O down here has eggs inside of it. That's where the seeds will eventually form. It has a style which just is lifting up the portion that collects the pollen. The stigma is sticky and it's at the end. Uh, that's where the pollen will stick to it. So ways I remember the, the parts of this is uh, the stigma is sticky and it's up at the top. The style reminds me of a style show, Runway. So that's, if you're trying to remember the name of that, the style is that long portion. It's like the, the catwalk on a runway. And then uh, the ovary is the big O where the eggs are inside down at the bottom. So uh, collectively, again, that's all called the pistil and that's the female portion and it's in the center of the flower. So those are your basic flower parts. Again, stamen, pistil is the female portion. We have the perianth. Uh, the, ma the male portion has the anther and the filament. The female portion has the stigma, the sticky tip, the style, the long tube, and the ovary, which is the bottom part the bit where the eggs are located. And then, of course, the perianth has petals and sepals within it. So let's talk a little bit about pollination now that we've seen what a flower looks like. What happens when pollination occurs? So uh, because this all happens in the flower, I'm doing it now instead of under plant processes, but you're going to have a pollen grain that lands on the sticky stigma up at the, the, the tip of the female portion of the flower. It will create a pollen tube. It releases an enzyme when it comes in contact with the stigma and it will create an enzyme and that enzyme will actually start working its way through the style, through the, the, the cells of the style. And uh, it will create this pollen tube that grows down through the style until it gets down to where the ovules are. are and then inside those ovules are eggs. One fruit, you think about it, if a fruit has a lot of seeds in it, that means there's a lot of ovules in there and it has to have a lot of pollen to to uh, fertilize that ovule. 
Think about like a cantaloupe. A cantaloupe has tons of seeds or a pumpkin. So you have to have a lot of pollen to create all of, of those seeds inside. But basically that, that pollen grain will create the pollen tube. The sperm will work its way through the pollen tube down to the ovule where it joins with the egg, creates a zygote, uh, which is the sperm and the egg com uh, combining together into a single cell, uh, which will then multiply into the future seeds and the future plants. So that is how pollination occurs. Uh, that's the basics of a flower. We're going to go into fruits and look at a monocot versus a dicot, and it, which will be a dry fruit versus a, uh, a dry fruit or a grain like corn or wheat versus a fleshy fruit. We're going to look at a peach here. Just to, again, some basic terms you want to look at. Again, the fruit is a ripened ovary. Uh, as it matures, then the seeds will form and uh, it does take time. You may have a ripe fruit, but your seeds inside may not be fully ripe either. So is it, you've got to give that fruit time to fully ripen till it's ready to fall off really to make sure the seeds are ripe inside. The ovary wall becomes the pericarp and that, remember, because the seeds inside, the plantlets inside, it's going to have an area on the outside and that pericarp is going to have three sections to it. And it's the pericarp, that ovary, that's going to store the food for the future for that, that seedling uh, to start to emerge. So here, the pericarp is going to consist of the exocarp, the mesocarp, and the endocarp. Exo meaning outer, so it's the outside layer here on, or the hairy part of the fruit, or it's the outside dry layer of this corn. Uh, you have a, a mesocarp which is going to be a, a thin layer here of the in the just inside uh, but it's going to be the fleshy part of your peach fruit and then you have an endocarp which is what's protecting the seed and uh, inside that where the true seed is is where you're going to find the endosperm which is holding the carbohydrates that is stored for that seedling to use to form a root and to get out of the soil and begin growing a new plant. So your seeds in the middle here, you think about the pit of that, that peach, really what we call the pit of the peach is really the endocarp, that hard endocarp and the true seed part is in the middle of that. Um, but it is there for protection. And then you have that fleshy mesocarp of the fruit and again, the hairy exo out, exocarp. Just so that you're familiar with a few of those terms, you won't see them a lot, but if you're doing uh, more in-depth classes or some research, you may hear those words. And I want you to realize that, that the pericarp is consisting of the exo, meso, and endocarps, and it's all part of the fruit. That's the bottom line. So there are different types of fruits that are out there, and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. You may hear some of these terms. We're not going to spend much time on them. But some of the types of fruits that are out there are berries, there are peepos, there are pomes, there are hesperidiums, there's a droop, a pod, an aggregate, and then there can be what we call multiple fruits um, or fused fruits. And so I'm going to show you these uh, some examples of each of these very quickly. And again, this is just to say, oh, okay, that's what a real berry is. That's what a peepo is, if I hear that term peepo. Uh, or a droop or a hesperidium, not going to hear it very often because uh, most everyone's just going to say, oh, it's a fruit or a berry. And you may be surprised because there's some things that are berries you don't think of as berries and some things we call berries that aren't. So I'm going to start with that one right now is berries. And a berry will have one to many seeds inside and there is no stony component to it. So uh, the the seeds do not have a stony uh out a layer to it. A, a tomato, believe it or not, is a considered a berry when you look at it from a botanical standpoint. And even grapes are considered a berry. And so you have this individual uh, fruit and inside it is going to be where your seeds are. It could be a single seed like in a grape or it can be a multiple seed like in a tomato. 
So a, a tomato is really a form, a very large berry. So that can blow your mind. One of the things that can blow your mind right now. Uh, a peepo has a thick rind with multiple seeds and they all come up from a single flower. And so the classic example is going to be a cucumber or a cantaloupe or a melon, something like that. Uh, so those are peepos. Uh, so maybe that'll be a fun thing to teach someone when you go to the store and buy your cucumber uh, or cut it up for your salad the next time. Say, oh, look at that cute little peepo there. Um, a poem is an ovary that's surrounded by a fleshy hypanthium, which is just a special uh, term for the mesocarp. Uh, and the, the classic example are going to be pears and uh, apples. So you're going to see that with apples and pears have a hypanthium. It's what they consider the um, mesocarp in it. You'll have definitely have seeds in that in the core and near the middle. And again, this flower stalk here, uh, this was the ovary. So this was that old flower stalk. So if you think about it, it's, it's, it's the pedicel which was where the flower used to attach to the stem. So again, this used to be the flower. And then here, this is the remnants at the tip, the, the remnants of the calyx. Remember the calyx is what we call the, um, the sepals uh, when they were, I believe it was the sepals that are together. So it's that, that remnant of the flower there and then the base of it then expands into the fruit called the poem. A Hesperidium is a segmented uh, fruit uh, with different carpels within each one. And that's going to be all of your citrus are going to be the Hesperidiums, the oranges, the grapefruits, the uh, tangerines. And so when you peel them, you know how they have those little segments coming in. And that's really what makes it the Hesperidium. Uh, a droop is going to be something that has a fleshy outside component uh, and then that hard stony endocarp. A peach is a form of droop. Uh, that hard seed is the pit, inside is the seed. And even a coconut, believe it or not, is considered a droop, uh, but that is a monocot versus a dicot fruit. So the inside, that stony layer is what we think of as the main coconut. But if you really look at coconuts being formed on a coconut palm, you're going to have that kind of fruit husk, that thick layer uh, around the main coconut where the seed is inside. So that's a droop. A pod, we're familiar with pea pods, bean pods. Again, you have multiple seeds inside. You have uh, that row of ovules uh, and they, as they are pollinated from the uh, the stigma of that flower, all of these individual uh, ovaries are then pollinated and they mature into seeds. And that's how you get peas and beans. And uh, you have that pod. Uh, and then the, the pod or the carpal uh, will split open when it's fully mature and ready for those seeds to uh, expand. So that's what we see here with uh, a bee or a pea, a pea or a bean, but you'll also see it in things. Think about a pod. That's exactly what we're seeing in uh, plumeria. When plumeria or um, desert roses are germinated. So they're really kind of like a pod with this uh, carpal, simple carpal inside, simple ovary with rows of, of uh, the uh, seeds inside. An aggregate uh, is where you have multiple fruit pieces that are all put together uh, on a strawberry. A strawberry and a raspberry really are not true berries. They're aggregate fruits. And uh, with that, uh, there are separate pistils uh, within one flower. So you're going to have a lot of pistils within a single flower. And as they merge together, they aggregate and form what appears to be a single or an aggregated fruit. So that's where we see strawberries and raspberries. And then you can have multiple ovaries that fuse together. And uh, two examples of what we consider 
uh, a multiple fruit are going to be the fused sections you see here of the pineapple or the uh, fused berry here of a mulberry. Those are technically by the botanist considered to be multiple fruits. And that's plenty of to, to talk about on fruits. I think we've covered enough just to give you some ideas that what you think's a berry may not be a berry. And there's a lot of different weird names of types of fruit if you're going to be a botanical scholar. But we're not going to be botanical scholars. So we're going to move on then to seeds. And the reason we want to get into seeds now is the function of seeds is the, the end result of sexual reproduction, and that is going to be genetic variability. We've got to have that change so that you'll have some plants, just like we have some animals that are stronger than others that can handle difficult situations better than others. So we need that genetic variability. You think about um, when we talk about interbreeding, lots of times when you don't have genetic variability, you get very weakened animals or weakened even you know if you remember back in the uh, the royals used to intermarry within their families and they would have very weakened uh, immune system so with genetic variability comes strength for the species and that's why it's so important to have seed production for plants as well to have some variations and uh, protect it otherwise if you have everything that's exactly alike a disease could come through and wipe out an entire species or an entire population uh, when there's not much genetic variability. The other thing about a seed, a seed has three basic parts to it. And you, if you can think about this, it'll help you understand how we have to protect seeds and when we're planting seeds. A seed contains uh, a cotyledon or the endosperm, and which is kind of like the food source for that seed uh, is either the cotyledon or the endosperm, and that's the food or the backpack full of food for the, the baby plant. You're gonna have an embryo, which is the baby plant, and that is inside the seed. And because it is a baby plant, it is alive, it is breathing. It means it has to have oxygen. Um, and that's why you can't just submerge seeds uh, underwater for long periods of time. And also it has a seed coat, and that's a protective outer layer. So I kind of think about it as you have a baby, it has a backpack full of food or uh, baby bottles or whatever you want to say, but it has a backpack full of food with it. And then it's wrapped up in a blanket or a seed coat uh, for protection. And that's what every seed basically has. So whether you're talking about a monocot, like this, the corn seed we talked about, it has the seed coat on the outside. That's the protective layer. It has the endosperm, which is going to be the food source for it. And then it has the baby plant inside or uh, the, em the embryo the baby plant. And when it starts to emerge, the, the root comes down, it cracks open that seed coat, the root comes out, starts to grow, and then the, the single cotyledon, the leaf sheet starts to expand and move up, allowing the, the true plant to move up until you get um, a small horn plantlet. And again, this one would have fibrous roots on it. A dicot is similar. We've seen beans grow time and time again. Again, within that seed, you're going to have the endosperm. That's the food source or the cotyledon uh, within it. You're going to have true leaves in it. This is a, a true root and a true leaf inside. So you have the baby plant and you have a seed coat. Once the seed coat uh, water emerges through the seed coat, it uh, changes some uh enzyme processes within the seed. It causes the seed to start to expand. Uh, then it's going to throw out a little root coming down, and then it's going to pull that seedling up. The cotyledons will split, and then the new plantlet with true leaves will start, uh, the true leaves will start to expand there. And in that process, as the, the seedling uses the stored food in the cotyledons, then those cotyledons will shrivel, and that's why you see that on bean plants. Uh, as a dicot, remember, it does have more of a taproot system. So you have larger roots. That central first root is going to be the largest one. And then you're going to have smaller roots and smaller roots beyond that in a kind of a netted uh, root system. So that's the end of plant seeds. Uh, so we've done that. It's taken us about 50 minutes. 
to cover that. I have about an hour to cover plant processes, and I do this all the time within an hour. A lot of this we've already talked about. So think about the plant processes as the review of what I've already covered in all those plant parts, uh, maybe going into a little more detail on some of them. So these are the plant processes we're going to cover in the next 65 minutes, uh, which is about 10 minutes longer than I usually get to do this. So y'all are y'all are getting it easy. Uh, the plant processes we're going to cover right now are going to include translocation, which is in the vascular system. We're going to cover photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, evaporation, photoperiodism, thermal floral induction, dormancy, and tropisms. So we can cover all of these things in about the next 60 minutes or so and give you that good overview of what's happening inside the plant. Again, a lot of this is just, I want you to be familiar with some of the terms. One of the big parts we talk about is translocation. Translocation uh, is the transport system within the plant. It is uh, the movement of those substances through the vascular system. The vascular system consists of two things we talked about last time, the xylem and the phloem. Uh, that vascular system, I like to think of it as the highway system. Uh, the uh, two main tissues, again, xylem and phloem. The xylem is moving water and nutrients up. I like to think of, of it being moving up like on the interstate. Think about I-37, taking things from the roots here at the port in Corpus Christi up into the factories in San Antonio. The xylem is the northbound lane of I-37. It's moving the raw materials up to where the factories are. And then uh, once they make the products, they're going to ship them back to the port through the phloem, moving the sugars and the carbohydrates down the southbound lane of I-37 into the port, uh, which would be the root system of the plant. So maybe that will help you a little bit understanding translocation. Remember, xylem moves water and nutrients up, phloem moves sugar and carbohydrates down. Back to the thing we talked about, the epidermis is the outside of the stem because the vascular system is most prominent in the stem. Uh, there are vascular bundles in a monocot. With each of these will have xylem and phloem. And then there's stuff between them that could be storing water, storing uh, carbohydrates, or just there as spacers. And that's the cortex. That's the, all the area in a monocot stem between the vascular bundles. In a dicot, you remember we talked about it having rings, and we saw that even within the 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 um, vascular system in this the leaf, you can see mono having the the xylem and the phloem within it. Uh, the phloem again is the outside layers, and that will conduct water and nutrients. I mean, will conduct the carbohydrates down. The xylem is towards the inside, and that's taking the water and the nutrients from the root system up into the leaves through the stems. And that layer in the middle called the cambium, remember, it is making new xylem and new phloem. It makes new xylem to the inside. It makes new phloem to the outside. As that happens, you get more and more cells in the middle, and it pushes the outside of the stem out. And that's how stems grow in girth. Uh, and you think about it, that phloem over time, uh, that oldest phloem starts to be pushed out and pushed out until it starts to crack off. And that's the bark that's there as an outside layer. Think about a, a balloon. If you paint a balloon and you blow it up, then that outside layer, as it gets larger, is going to crack open. And that's similar to what you think of as that oldest phloem, as new phloem is formed inside of it, pushes it out and cracks the old phloem that's no longer active off in the form of bark. And again, you've got to protect that phloem layer uh, so that you have uh, carbohydrates moving from the leaves down into the root system because roots cannot make their own food. They are dependent on sugars made in the leaf system. So you want to protect that out outer layer of phloem. And uh, that's why the bark's so important. Again, Weed eaters can do so much damage to the vascular system without realizing it. Protect the base of those plants, the base of those trees. You can buy a little plastic cover that goes around them. Uh, easiest way to protect it that way. But if you start seeing damage at the base of that, 
Think about the phloem. If it gets into uh, past the bark, then that next layer is going to be the phloem. You're going to start starving the roots and it produces a slow, slow death for that, that plant. Uh, if you get past the phloem, then you, you remove the cambium and then that plant will stop growing completely in girth uh, because it can't make xylem to the inside either. And uh, that old xylem, the area near the cambium is the most active, but in the middle, that old xylem just keeps building up in the middle, and that's the hardwood of the tree. So again, that active layer is kind of the outside section of a tree branch or a, a tree trunk. So that's all of, of the vascular system. Xylem moves water and nutrients up. The phloem moves carbohydrates down from this into the root system and throughout the plant. If you understand that component of it, you got the basics of the vascular system. And we can move on then to photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is, uh, the word photo means light. We just talked about this a few minutes ago. Synthesis means to create. So photosynthesis is creating something in the presence of light, and that would be sugars. Uh, only plants can make their own food, and it requires light and chlorophyll. Only plants can make their own food. Remember that. That's why everything is dependent upon plants. You know, uh, some animals eat plants directly, like a cow. Even we can eat plants. But then there's other things that are that are meat eaters. They'll eat other animals that eats an animal that eats an animal that eats an animal that somewhere down the line eats a plant. And it could be that it eats uh, algae in the sea, something like that. But at some point, Everything is connected to plants. So if you love plants and everyone goes, I don't know why you like plants, think about it as, you know what? I love plants because plants are the basis of life. Everything is connected to plants. So you better start liking my plants a little bit more. So that gives you a little bit of ammunition against those plant haters in your life. All living creatures, like I said, are tied to plants. And those leaves... Again, the photosynthesis occurs in the leaves. That is where the plant factories are because that's where the chlorophyll is. The chlorophyll is necessary. It, it, it captures the light energy needed to create the sugar, the sugars. And uh, so we'll talk about that in just a minute. Photosynthesis, the product of photosynthesis is uh, carbohydrates and sugars. That is the purpose of photosynthesis. That plant is trying to create sugars. And back to something I mentioned before, I believe, was that term plant food. Uh, if you buy a box of plant food, you're really not buying plant food. You're buying nutrients. You're buying a fertilizer. The plant food is technically the carbohydrates and the sugars that are being produced in the plant. So don't get caught up in that term plant food. Try to be part of the solution and tell people that's not real plant food. That's just really nutrients or that's just fertilizers because that plant's still going to have to make its own food in the leaves. This is a, a prettier picture than I showed you before, but I didn't want you to see the same thing over and over. Again, this is the structure of a leaf. You'll see the cuticle, the waxy substance on the top. You see the epidermis on the top. Uh, every now and then you'll have a few uh, stomatal openings uh, with the guard cells and the, the leaf surface. Most of those are underneath though. So this particular diagram shows one up above. That's not common. Again, it's not green. You see it's kind of clear because there's no chlorophyll in it. You have the uh, columns or the palisade uh, parenchyma, palisade mesophyll, uh, those columns of cells uh, that have lots of chlorophyll in them at the surface of the leaf. That's where the sun will come down. It's being absorbed by the chlorophyll in here. It absorbs the energy of the sun and uses it for photosynthesis. And then you have the spongy parenchyma. We talked about it, where the air is moving in between it. That's the sponge-like layer uh, of cells. You have the xylem and the phloem here in the plant vein. You have the collinchyma or that uh, those connecting cells that holds the 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 vein in place. You have the lower epidermis, again, more protection with more cuticle and the guard cells below. So looking at this, you have xylem and phloem within that vein. Remember that they're separated, xylem and phloem, because, uh, and the guard cells here 
are moving air in and out of the leaf. It's regulating both moisture and oxygen and carbon dioxide levels within. So that's where it's happening. This green part, particularly the upper, the palisade parenchyma is where the majority of chlorophyll uh, photosynthesis is going to happen in the plant, some in the spongy mesophyll. And again, they can happen some in the stems if it's green, but it's not going to be the same percentage as what you would find in the leaves. The leaves is the primary spot. The plant factories, you just see the plant factory right there real well. So let's talk about the chemistry of photosynthesis. Chem photosynthesis is nothing but a chemistry lesson. And so many of y'all are better going, oh, I hate chemistry. I didn't do well in chemistry. This is simple chemistry. And if you understand this one simple thing, it's going to go, oh, that's that's so, I can I get that. It's going to uh, teach you not just photosynthesis, but it's going to teach you about another process as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the chemistry of photosynthesis, photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide out of the air. It takes water that's being supplied through the root system and it creates a sugar molecule. A basic sugar molecule is a C6H12O6 and there's leftover oxygen when that happens. That's, that is what, that's the chemistry of photosynthesis. You, you know, we know that plants need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. So it's carbon dioxide and water. And then you have to have light. Light is what connects it all together. It provides the power source to connect all those together. And then uh, you're going to have extra oxygen at the end. If you remember uh, something about chemistry, though, is that you've got to have a balanced equation. I can hear uh, Betty Snyder, my, my high school chemistry teacher, telling us this. You got to have the balanced equation over there. So... If you look at the sugar molecule, you've got to have six carbon uh, molecules right here. And you've got to have six carbons in order to make one sugar. And so with that, if I have six over here, I've got to have six on the other side of the equation. And here I have 12 hydrogens. That means I have to have at least 12 hydrogens on this side. And then I need six oxygens to make that sugar molecule. I have to have at least six over here. Right now I can see one, two, three. And then it says there's extra oxygen. So we're gonna see that in order to balance this, I've gotta have at least six, six carbons. The only way to get six carbons is to have six molecules of carbon dioxide. So I'm gonna have six CO2s and to have 12 hydrogens, it only comes from water. Each water molecule has two. I need two times what is 12, six. So I need six water molecules. So in that process, you have six carbon dioxides plus six water molecules is going to give you one sugar molecule. See, six times, see, one, there's a one there. Six times one is six. Six times the O2 here is going to give you you're gonna have more than you need there. This is where your leftover oxygen comes from the carbon dioxide. So six O2s, guess what? You, oh, that's your leftover, your six O2 over here. Then you have six times two is 12 hydrogens and six times the, the single oxygen, that's six oxygens. So if you look at the water molecule, you're basically taking half the, the carbon off of the CO2, attaching it, binding them all together, using the energy of the sun and you have leftover oxygen. That is photosynthesis. It requires light energy. That light is absorbed through the chlorophyll um, in, the, in the chloroplasts, which is the green organelle in those green cells. So that's the chemistry of photosynthesis. Six carbon dioxides, six waters gives you one sugar plus six extra oxygens at the end. Where does this happen? It's happening in the leaves. Think about it, the sunlight is absorbed by the leaf in the chlorophyll, the carbon dioxide is moving up into the leaf through the uh, stomatal pores, remember, through the guard cells, uh, the openings between the guard cells, and water is coming up through the root system. So it all merges here in the factory of the leaf using the sun as the light energy. It binds, 
uh, takes that light energy, it turns it into a chemical bond that binds that all together into a sugar molecule. And that sugar molecule, the carbohydrate, is then moved back through the stem of the into other parts of the plant. And then there's leftover oxygen, which is released through the stomatal pores on the bottom side of the leaf and into the, the air. You know, some people say, you know, photosynthesis creates oxygen. Well, oxygen's just the byproduct. Remember that. And you know what? I am so thankful it is because it gives us extra oxygen to breathe as animals. Um, but just, I wanted you to realize that, that the oxygen is a byproduct. So with photosynthesis, I want to then talk to you about the next process in plants, which is respiration. And there's a few things, I, a few statements I want you to think about respiration that you've probably heard in the past. Um, and then there's some misinformation that maybe you've heard also. So one of the things is that I remember being told when I was a little bitty that, you know, animals breathe in oxygen and plants breathe in what? in order to live. The first thing most people say is, oh, plants breathe in carbon dioxide. That's not right. Remember the carbon dioxide is being used for photosynthesis, not to breathe. Plants need oxygen. If you said carbon dioxide, that plants breathe in carbon dioxide to live, you're wrong. Plants have to have oxygen. They respire just like animals do. And that requires oxygen because that's the way cells, living cells work, is that they um, have to release oxygen through that process we call respiration. And that happens in the mitochondria inside every single living cell. So it's respiration occurring in the mitochondria. Respiration is basically the breakdown of a carbohydrate or a sugar. And in that process, energy is released when those chemical bonds are broken apart. Um, that is what's happening in respiration. So remember, plants will respire. They will breathe in oxygen 24 hours a day, just like animals do. Plants are breathing 24 hours a day, but they only are doing photosynthesis during the light hours. And all cells, every single cell that's alive in an animal or a plant requires oxygen for respiration. And that's why, again, even though seeds, um, seeds are respiring and they are using up the stored sugars, the stored carbohydrates in that seed. And that's part of the reason we often refrigerate them or freeze them even to slow down the respiration process so that they're not using the stored carbohydrates as quickly. And the other reason you can't just grow uh, seeds underwater, especially uh, if they can drown, a seed can drown because the little baby plant is still trying to respire. And if there's not oxygen available to it, then it will eventually drown by not having uh, adequate oxygen. So uh, the other thing we have to remember is that plants don't have a respiratory system. Like we have a circulatory system and a respiratory, a respiratory system where the, the uh, blood vessels are going into our lungs to to exchange the oxygen. That's not happening the same way in a plant. It doesn't have a respiratory system. That all happens through the trans, uh, through the leaves and also through the, uh, you'll get some of it through the uh, translocation component of through the xylem and the phloem. You can have a little bit in there, but really you got to remember those plants don't have the ability to move oxygen down unless they're, they have special modifications. And some plants do. Uh, you think about a cypress tree in a swamp has the knees that come up. That has special air tubes that allow air to move down into the root system because those roots that are underwater are still needing oxygen. Uh, that's why we talk about needing to have uh, some plants need don't like wet feet because the roots will die very quickly and they don't have anything uh, to help move water. They don't have any specialized uh, adaptations to allow air to move into those root systems when they're waterlogged. So again, uh, roots, leaves, stems, all those living cells are all respiring. Just remember that. Respiration is another chemical process, but guess what? It's taking the sugar molecule. And we said to when we're breathing, we need oxygen. 
And the result is that when we breathe, we create carbon dioxide. And then there's leftover water. Well, you know what? This looks really familiar because if we go back and remember Mrs. My, my chemistry teacher, Mrs. Snyder said, we got to balance that equation. Guess what? We're going to balance it into one sugar molecule, C6H12O6, plus six oxygens is going to give me six CO2s and six water molecules. Guess what this is? This is the exact opposite of photosynthesis. And in the process, we have broken down all of these bonds that tied that uh, carbon dioxide, I mean, the sugar molecule together. We, as we break that up, each of those chemical bonds releases energy. And that's what respiration is. So think about that big model of the sugar molecule with all the little sticks and the round balls on it from chemistry. When each of those little sticks breaks apart, that's releasing energy. So again, as carbohydrates are break down, they release energy or heat and oxygen is required to do that. And then we have uh, water that is released. That is a byproduct of uh, that water and carbon dioxide are the byproducts of breaking down the sugar molecule. And that's, you think about it, if you want to find out if someone's uh, still alive, you remember what they used to say, take a mirror, put it under their, their nose or their mouth, and you'll see, what, what do you see? You're not seeing the carbon dioxide, you're seeing the water vapor appear on there because the water is the byproduct of respiration. So photosynthesis versus respiration. I told you there, the, the two sides of the same coin. They're the opposites. So with photosynthesis, we'll produce food where respiration is going to use that sugar for uh, the energy in the plant. You have photosynthesis that stores energy. Respiration is going to release energy. Photosynthesis occurs in all cells with chloroplasts. That's the green cells. And this is the difference where respiration happens in all cells. Where photosynthesis is releasing oxygen, respiration is going to require oxygen. And where photosynthesis uses water or requires water, that means respiration is going to produce a byproduct of water, the exact opposite uh, of each other in that process. So if you understand photosynthesis, you can understand respiration. If you understand respiration, you can understand photosynthesis. So that's that's about three weeks of, of biology uh, in 10 minutes or less. Another one I wanna talk about real quick is transpiration. Transpiration is uh, the loss of water inside a plant leaf. And this is the natural cooling process within that plant. The loss of water inside the leaf. Uh, it is produces the evaporative cooling effect. If you've ever gotten out of the shower or gotten out of the pool and you have water on your skin, uh, as that water evaporates, your skin is chilled. And what's happening is the water evaporates, it's pulling heat. It requires heat to change the water from a liquid to a vapor. It's using heat out of the body. It's pulling heat away and thus cooling the, the structure. This can happen inside of a leaf to help regulate the temperature inside the leaf. And that's really gonna be important. In the summer, Research has shown, uh, Texas A&M did a lot of work on transpiration and water loss uh, in the, the 80s. And they found that up to 80% of the water that's being absorbed by roots in the summer in particular can be used for transpiration. So a lot of the water that you're putting on your plants is not, being, is not going to cause growth of that plant or be used on pro other processes inside like photosynthesis it's primarily being used to keep that plant cool because it is the cooling process. Things that affect transpiration are temperature, light levels, wind, and humidity. Um, so depending on what your temperature is, it can affect the transpiration. So let's go over a little bit of this. If you want to see transpiration, an, a fun way to do this, a good, this is not an experiment. This is a demonstration. There is a difference. Uh, a demonstration just allows you to show someone what basically happens. A, a, a true experiment is going to have a control where you say, this is uh, without this treatment and this is with the treatment and here's where, how that treatment affects that plant. So this is a cool demonstration. Put a plastic bag over a, a leafy green uh, 
plant part and you will see the water vapor appearing. And that's because water is being taken up from the, the soil through the roots. It's being ex, ex, uh, transpired in the leaf and released through the stomatal opening. So you have excessive water vapor in the bag then. So that's a really way, cool way to show someone transpiration. This is all being regulated because of the guard cells and the stomatal openings in the bottom of the leaf. A guard cell, again, when it's flaccid, the stoma is closed, the hole is closed to hold the moisture in and hold um, oxygen inside the, the, the leaf. But when, you, when it, you need to get rid of water, you need to get rid of of carbon dioxide, so you need to to uh, that the so the uh, plant will then add water to the guard cells, and as it adds it, it actually makes them expand and opens uh, the hole in the middle. So that's how the the guard cells work. It absorb it. It uses more water. It pulls water into that cell. It expands it, and it opens. Uh, it opens the hole in the middle by pushing out on the outside edges. So uh, with that, the, the transpiration process, uh, how is it affected by temperature, light levels, wind, and humidity? Well, at higher temperature, you're going to have more transpiration because the temperature is high, that plant wants to stay cooler. The best temperature for for photosynthesis and most plant processes is about 80 degrees. And there's a lot of the time of the year, we're not, we're not between that 65, 80 degree range, we're higher. So that plant is using more water in the summer for transpiration to stay cool so it can keep undergoing photosynthesis. So high temperature is going to increase transpiration. Bright light, high light levels is going to increase transpiration because light is energy, it's hot, it heats up the leaf, it needs to cool down. It's going to use water, evaporate. Wind can also increase transpiration because as that wind is blowing across that leaf, it is sucking water out. It increases the transpiration inside and pulling any uh, water vapor directly around that leaf away. So that's why in the winter, when we have uh, cold fronts coming in, or you have a really windy day in the summer, you may have to water more just because that air, it, that wind moving across the leaf is sucking water out of it. And then humidity is kind of the opposite. When you have very high humidity, your transpiration is reduced. So uh, humid areas tend to have a little bit less transpiration uh, than dry areas. So if it's hot and dry versus hot and humid, you're gonna have more transpiration in that hot, dry area. That's why you use more water in the desert than you do here by the coast. So you have a little bit of regulation, positive regulation by the, the humidity. So again, high temperature, high transpiration, high light, high transpiration, high wind, high transpiration, high humidity, low transpiration. So I hope that helps you understand um, the how those work together. So we've seen that, we saw that it works. Let's talk a little bit about evaporation. We sort of just talked about it. Evaporation technically is anything that's in, occurring outside of the plant. When evaporation occurs, that's get that's water being transformed from a liquid state into a gas state and it occurs outside the plant, we call it evaporation. So um, most of the time when we're talking about evaporation, it could be on the outside leaf surface. Uh, it, like if you've sprinkled the leaf of your plant, it can evaporate on the outside. Technically that's evaporation. But the place we talk about it most in horticulture is in the soil. Uh, when water is evaporating from the soil, it is truly evaporation. And when it evaporates from the soil, that means that that water's not there for the root to take up. So you're losing water in the soil at the root, at the surface of the soil. And that's why we mulch to try to hold moisture in so that the roots can take up at that moisture and the plant can use it for transpiration. So that's evaporation. And again, mulching is one way to help to reduce that. Evaporation happening in the soil, 
you know, uh, this shows you where precipitation, the rain falls down, it's, it falls into the soil. Uh, it's taken up by the roots. It's lost through the leaves or it's lost. It evaporates in the soil. So that's kind of the one of the ways that that precipitation uh, moves either through the plant or is lost through the soil when it's sunny. That's the end of, of that. So we did evaporation and transpiration very quickly. Uh, pretty much the same thing, only it depends on whether it's in the plant or outside of the plant. Another term you may hear periodically is photoperiodism. And photo means light, periodism, period means a, an amount of time. So photoperiodism is how a plant reacts to the duration of light. That's what photoperiodism is. And plant responses, usually we're talking about flower induction due to the day length is what people will talk, talk about in photoperiodism. How plants respond to the amount of light, the length of light. We have what we call short day plants and we have long day plants. And technically, uh, short day plants is a misnomer. It's not the length of the day that matters as much as the uninterrupted night period. That uninterrupted night or that long night is what causes some plants to go into bloom. And some of those examples, poinsettias, chrysanthemums, colanchos, aloes actually are also short day plants. You'll see aloes blooming in the winter when you're not going to see them blooming uh, in the summertime. So as the days get shorter, the nights get longer and they're uninterrupted, you're going to see blooming on these types of plants. That's what we call photoperiodism. And for long day, that means you need a short night. You want that interruption of the night uh, in order to, to keep some plants blooming. And some examples of that are lettuce, cilantro, and even crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles bloom in the summer when you have uh, long days and short nights. You don't see crepe myrtles blooming in the winter, uh, even when there's still leaves on that plant. Lettuce and cilantro, those are great examples of plants that when you have long uninterrupted days and short nights, um, that plant will, what we call bolt, it'll produce a flower spike very quickly. Fennel does the same thing this time of year. Fennel is, is flowering a lot because it has um, that short night, long day period in the summer. That's why you can't grow lettuce down here to eat in the summer. You're going to get flowering lettuce. You get flowering cilantro. It'll grow for a little bit, but then it, it's very short-lived uh, where you'll have cilantro and lettuce that grow and grow and grow during the winter months because you have long nights, long uninterrupted nights and short days. <clears throat> uh, photo, uh, you can also have day neutral plants. Those are days, those are plants that it doesn't matter if it's long days or short days. The, it does not affect whether they're flowering or not. So day neutral plants are the easiest ones for us to deal with typically. <clears throat> Our day length is influenced by the seasons and uh, where we are located north to south. So Corpus Christi is at 27.68 north when you start looking at where we fall on the globe. Uh, <clears throat> we are a semi-tropical environment. But as you get further north, remember, in you're going to have uh, very, very, very long nights during the winter and very short days. But in the summer right now, the northern part of the U.S., you may only have a six-hour night. You know, uh, I remember going up in, in June up to Wisconsin, and it was still light at 10 p.m., and it would, like, freak me out. It was hard to go to sleep. But that will affect the way plants bloom as well. So that's why I wanted you to, to see that. So those areas, uh, it they're more extreme. Down here, as we get closer to the equator, they're going to be less differences in your day and night lengths in the winter and in the summer. So photoperiodism, <clears throat> uh, particularly, this is going to be a short day, long night plant like a poinsettia. If you have, uh, for a poinsettia to bloom, you have to have a short day with long, uninterrupted dark period. 
If you have a long day with short night period, you're going to have vegetative growth. You can make this plant, you can trick this plant to stay vegetative by breaking up the night period. So here, if you have your regular daytime period and then it gets dark, if you come in the middle of the night and you turn on a light that has red light, because it's it's the red waves that causes um, the transition in photoperiodism. If you, you add red light, which we use primarily with incandescent lights in the middle of the night and break it up, that plant will stay vegetative. So that's why um, people that are growing poinsettias at first, they want to get a certain amount of size to them before they go into flowering mode. They want lots of leaves. They want a big, healthy plant. They want a good, strong plant with lots of leaves on it. Because also those leaves on poinsettias, the leaves actually change colors. Uh, they're specialized leaves called bracts that will change colors. So you want a lot of leaves and you want it uh, uh, thick and dense. If it gets uh, long nights too early, you're going to have very few leaves and, and a very poor quality plant. So growers in the summertime, when they're getting there, right now they're starting to get um, poinsettia cuttings in, in in August up to the early September, depending on the variety that they're using and where they're located. And they will grow them and they will make sure lights come on at night to make sure those plants are staying vegetative no matter what. Um, so that's, that's how that works. Uh, Here's some long day plants, an iris versus a goldenrod. Goldenrod, you could make that a poinsettia if you want, but this was an example I found. I thought it showed it really well. A long day iris plant, irises bloom in the summer. They don't bloom in the winter down here. Uh, where you have a long day, a short night, it's going to be flowering because it's a long day plant, short night. When you get into the fall, you have a long, uninterrupted dark period and, and short days. You don't get flowers. If you would like your irises to be blooming, if you're able to break up the night period, you can have irises blooming in the winter. Uh, here, that would mean that you you expose them to light in the middle of the night with uh, a period of light, and it can be a minute. It most people will do it for like fifteen to thirty minutes just to make sure that it's fully uh, perceived by the the plant. But you could do that in the middle of the winter and get your irises to bloom. So if you have uh, irises in a little water garden in your, your patio, just turn the light on in the middle of the night in the winter and you can have blooming irises when no one else does. That, that short day plant, again, when you have a short night, you're not going to have flowers, long, long days. If you have that long, long night, it's when it's flowering like a poinsettia. But if you break up that, it's not going to go into flower. It's going to stay vegetative. So whether you're talking about a goldenrod, a chrysanthemum, a calancho, or a poinsettia, they're all affected by breaking up that, that night period. By having shorter dark periods, you're going to uh, not have flowers. By having long uninterrupted, and it's that uninterrupted dark period is important. Think about it with poinsettia. Let's see. Yeah. With poinsettias, uh, if you try to keep a poinsettia uh, year to year because you have a really pretty color that you like, if you have that plant out in your yard and it's near a security light and you turn that light on or it comes on when someone's around, that plant may not ever go into bloom. I had a, a story of a lady that, that came to the nursery where I worked and she could, couldn't figure out why her poinsettia is that she planted outside wouldn't bloom. And we finally figured out that uh, she planted them on the side of her house and there's a street that comes up that merges next to her uh, property on the side. She was on the kind of on the uh, corner, but there was a side street that came up and people's lights would flash uh, when they were driving at night and it would break up the night period where her poinsettias were planted and they never went into bloom. So she would have to, if she wanted them to bloom, she actually had to cover them for a period of time for about a month and a half to get the flowers to start developing. And once these, she started seeing color, then it wasn't as big of a deal. They would continue to, to uh, redden up the rest of the way. So, but that's the same thing. If you, if, if you have something that needs a, 
a long uninterrupted night period to bloom and it's on your patio and you hear something outside and you go turn on the light because the dog's barking, you have just bro- broken up that night period. You Once doesn't hurt, you do it, it may delay it a couple of days, but if you do that consistently, then you're not going to get that plant to flower. So that's kind of your take home for uh, sh- those short day, long night plants uh, that flower if they're on your patio. So Kalanchos on your patio, if you turn on your light at night, they're not going to be blooming. So Kalanchos that are are protected from security lights or patio lights, they're going to bloom uh, in the winter naturally. Let's cover next thermal floral uh, induction. Thermal meaning temperature, their temperature induced causes the flowers to uh, initiate on the plant. And usually it's cooling that we're looking at. And this is what flower bulbs, when you're buying bulbs from Holland and places like that, that's what you've got to see. Uh, Many of those exotic bulbs, the the lilies, the tulips, the daffodils, things like that, they're affected by the amount of cold weather. They need that in order to produce flower buds. And uh, so... That's the the basic you have right there. So that's one of the reasons that those are really temperate plants. And this is a survival mechanism for those temperate plants. Because if a tulip starts trying to grow in the middle of winter, just because it's a warm day, then it's probably going to freeze and it's never going to make its... uh, it's never going to make it through the, the life cycle uh, and complete its growing period. And so this is, it goes dormant in the winter and it requires a certain amount of cold weather before that plant starts changing the chemical inside that's holding it dormant. It is a survival mechanism for winter. And the first thing it wants to do when it's spring comes is it wants the flower to make sure it completes the life cycle and hopefully make more seeds and have lots of baby bulbs uh, from the seeds. That's why floral induction is so important. You see this, uh, some need, sometimes the amount of cold weather can affect the flower size, can affect, affect the affect the number of flowers. Um, Easter lilies is a great example. You can grow Easter lilies here in Corpus Christi and you may have bought Easter lilies and grew them. Uh, When you bought them, it probably had seven or eight flowers on it. Beautiful, tall plant. You plant them in your yard. It will flower, but you'll usually get one, maybe two flowers. The plant itself, the leaves are smaller. The flowers are much smaller than they were on the one you got. It's because there wasn't enough cold weather to let that, flower bud, those extra flower buds form um, inside the flower bulb. So you can see that you can force this by putting flower bulbs in refrigerators. But I'll tell you, by the time you look at the cost of electricity, buying extra refrigerators, things like that, you're smarter just buying new ones from a bulb grower that's further north that uh, we'll take those bulbs and make sure they're in a cold storage unit to make sure they get the proper amount and they will bloom. So uh, instead of fighting Mother Nature, uh, grow what's what's around here. Now, some of our, our warm season bulbs like amaryllis and crinum lilies and spider lilies, they don't need cold weather to initiate flowers. And that's why we have southern bulbs versus those northern bulbs. So don't think you're going to grow hyacinths. Or or tulips or uh, things like that. Some there are a few that that can adapt. Um, some of the narcissus, the paper whites, can handle somewhat warmer temperatures. I've had some luck with them down here. A few daffodil varieties can somewhat adapt, but we're kind of on the bottom edge of where they they can grow. Uh, but there's very few of those. They're the small little bitty ones. Uh, but most of those bulbs that you see that are winter bulbs from up north, they're temperate bulbs. They need to be up north. They don't need to be down here. 
So that's your take home as master gardeners when people ask you about bulbs and and why we don't have them. It's because they're not going to flower because it's not cold enough here. So then let's go and talk about dormancy real quick. Um, dormancy is uh, can be induced either by an environmental condition like being in cold weather uh, or by physiological conditions, that's the chemicals inside, things that can adjust the chemicals inside of a plant. So it could be done through drought stress and, and different things that can cause a plant to go dormant or uh, temperatures uh, from the outside. So uh, again, could be environmental, could be physiological, could be induced by hormones, adding certain hormones and chemicals to a plant. Flower buds in particular, um, we talk about dormancy in, in plants, particularly we're talking about flower buds needing cold in order to break dormancy. The flower buds have already been initiated on plants like azaleas or in those temperate fruits we talked about um, before. I believe we talked about apples and, and uh, why we don't grow apples and pears here because they need more cold weather. They are a temperate fruit. We don't have temperate conditions here. Um, so there's very few of those temperate fruits that will, that will manage to grow here. There are a few that have been developed that can take warmer temperatures, like some of the tropical, uh, semi-tropical peach varieties. You'll see them like names like Tropic Snow or, or Florida Prince, things like that. They're developed and need low amounts of chilling units. That was one of those charts we looked at the at the last unit. The chill unit is a cumulative number of hours between 32 degrees and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. When you have temperatures below 32, it's not accumulating chill units. When you have temperatures above 50, there's no chill unit accumulation. And the closer you are to that 32 to 35 degree temperature, you're going to get a one-to-one -one, um, accumulation of the chill units. And partial units are accumulated as you get higher, the upper 30s, the 40s, the 50s, uh, probably 75, 80% in the upper 30s. You start getting into closer to 50% when you're in the 40s and to 25% as you get uh, per hour when you're in the upper 40s. And so again, depending on how close you are to 32, the closer you are to 32, uh, but not under it will it give you faster accumulation of chill units, closer to one to one. And again, once you get your temperatures up above 50, 55 degrees, you start losing chill units. So you may accumulate a lot in an early cold snap. You have a start getting a warm January, you start losing uh, chill units and hopefully you'll get some more uh, cool weather to, to build that chill units back up so that you have uniform flowering. Again. Remember, when it, temperatures are below 32, that plant is completely dormant. It's not accumulating the chill units. That is that survival mechanism for these temperate plants that are up in cold areas of Michigan and Canada and Minnesota and places like that. That's not where we are here. The chill zone units, we showed this to you the other day because we don't get a lot of cold weather. We are looking for plants that have around two to 300 chill unit requirement. You go a little further inland, a little further north. Uh, those are plants, uh, when you look at varieties, look for those that would have closer to 400. You're in central Texas, you may see seven to six or 700. This is like Fredericksburg. Your peaches in Fredericksburg need 700 hours. We don't get 700 hours here. Don't try buying peach varieties up there and bringing them down here. Buy those, those peach varieties from nurseries, local nurseries, or mail order that have that three to 400 unit chill unit accumulation necessary. And then again, those up that are in the Dallas, Fort Worth area or up in uh, Lubbock or, or Amarillo, if they're used to growing certain peaches there, they're not gonna grow down here. Uh, same thing with apples. Very few apples uh, will grow in the four or 500 chill unit area, so. The last one I want to talk about are tropisms, and there's a couple of different types of tropisms. Tropisms, just so you're familiar with it, this is what appears to be plant movement. Really, it's a type of plant growth that's in response to 
that is a response to light or gravity. And that response is really a hormonal change inside the plant itself that causes the plant to stretch or appear to grow in a certain direction uh, based on where light is or where gravity is. So phototropism is when a plant is stretching towards the light. Uh, you've probably seen this when you grow a plant next to a window and it seems to lean towards the window. What it's basically doing is the stem on the dark side forms more auxins. It causes the cells to elongate slightly and causes that plant stem to stretch slightly towards the light. To correct it, you just turn the plant around and the cells then that are on the, the tilted, the, the bent side will start to stretch in the dark part and move back towards the light. That's phototropism. Gravitropism is when plants seem to be growing up. Maybe you've had a tomato plant that's fallen over and very quickly that plant will start growing, looks like it starts growing upward, uh, even though the pot is laying sideways. You uh, turn the plant pot back up, then it'll have a twisty, uh, curvy type of stem as it starts to <clears throat> try to grow upward away from the gravity. So um, you'll see this with palm trees <clears throat> that have been planted at an angle that it, they were at an angle, but the, all the new growth starts moving upward. And that's a gravitropism growing up. Same thing, like I said, you'll see it with uh, tomatoes. You can see that with other plants. <clears throat> and you can you can manipulate plants either by tilting them with gravitropism or if they're uh, things like coleus and things like that, you can play with the phototropism, letting it stretch towards the light. <clears throat> and the whole, the chemical that's causing this is auxins. Auxins are translocated from other parts, usually in the growing points. <clears throat> Excuse my voice down to the uh either the dark side or the uh for of the stem on a phototropism or the the bottom portion of the stem for a gravitropism response and it just causes those cells to stretch so it's caused by auxins auxins are the same hormones that are used for plant rooting so again auxins can be used in a lot of different ways but one of them is that plants use them for the tropism and really both of those are survival mechanisms that plant is needing that the leaves to move up to the light it wants to be the most efficient for photosynthesis uh, when a plant is in the dark it'll also have a uh, <clears throat> or is in a high shade the that stretched stem is a, similar to a, a a phototropism it's looking for light it stretches it has more auxins being thrown into the stretching those cell lengths causing to, to lengthen in that stem to get it up above the canopy of the trees or whatever is causing that shade. It needs to get up to the light. So that's kind of that same response. Or in gravitropism, it's, it's, uh, if that seedling is sideways, it, it stretches to get up because it needs the light. It is a response to get that plant up into where it's absorbing light. It absorbs light because it uses that light for what? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis allows that plant to make its own food, store sugars, and use those sugars for growth. So again, you can start seeing how all these things are related. So that's tropisms, uh, kind of a fun thing to look at, play with a little bit. Uh, if you have a plant that grows towards the window, just every periodically, every couple of weeks, spin it around so that uh, the plant will keep uh stretching back and forth and you have a uniform growth instead of a lopsided growth on it. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, are there any questions that y'all want to ask before I uh, I can go back through any part of the slides if you have a question about something I've covered today? See, and we still have 12 minutes left. You see, I, we, we got through that in a hurry. Do y'all have any questions on what I covered today? Hi, this is Sarah. Um, I had a question. Sure. You were talking about how we could kind of trick plants by breaking up the night cycles. Yes. With light. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there an option, like even if it's indoors, is there an option that's sort of like the opposite of that um, for the plants like cilantro that bolt and are so hard for us to grow in the summer? <clears throat> uh, the thing is, you've got to 
cover them. Basically, if you're covering them, that's what we do to poinsettias. If you can create some kind of a, a framework and you cover them at a certain time, it will make it feel like it's a, a darker period of night. The problem is you got to be careful of heat building up underneath that. So you've got to okay. block the light out. Usually it's done with a cloth material, not with uh, plastic because plastic is going to get hotter inside. So if you want to create a framework, you know, this is, it's a lot of work, but you can create some kind of a, a frame, put uh, some kind of a black sheet that's fitted around it so and, and attach it so that it stays dark. Or again, trying to plant those in areas where there's not security lights or things like that that can break up the night uh, is really an important part. Does that help a little? It does. Thank you. Especially you can do that with potted plants. I mean, you can even take a pot and move it into a closet or something. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of work. But, you know, I've seen them, people do that with a Christmas cactus because they're photoperiodic also. And they'll move them into a basement or something if they're up north or into a closet to try to force that, that bloom cycle for a period. Other questions? So you do have a few assignments. Go out and look at leaves. Remember, I wanted you to look at leaves. Look for pinnate and palmate and compound versus simple leaves. Uh, look at that mesquite leaf and see how it's doubly uh, compound. Uh, look and see where the the flower bud, the the I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, lateral buds are where that leaf is attached. Just a few observation things you can do based on what's there. And then look at flowers and look at how the, the flower parts are fused, like for the pistil or how many uh, stamen are on some of the, the flowers that have that distinctive yellow uh, stamen uh, sticking out. So just a few things to look at, or maybe it's take that plastic bag and, and play with the transpiration uh, example I showed you. Just, just something to have fun with. So uh, gardening can be fun and you can show people some neat stuff along the way. Any other questions? Last chance. Questions going once. Botany questions going twice. And we're going to call that a presentation then if no one has any other questions. Thank you, Dr. Womack. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Y'all have fun with Master Gardeners. We'll be seeing you out at the Botanical Gardens um, for several presentations. And, and uh, so I'll say hi to you when you're out here. So thank you all again. It's going to be a fun, a fun class. I always enjoy uh, teaching Master Gardeners and uh, just teaching people about plants in general. So y'all have fun with it. Good night, y'all.